Good morning. It's uh, my great pleasure to be speaking at uh, South by Southwest. I've spoken here a couple of times before. And previously, when I was speaking here, I was serving in a different role as the chief technology and uh, strategy officer for Cisco. So I switched industries about a little over a year ago. Um, and I now have the pleasure and the challenge of uh, leading a team uh, for NEO in Silicon Valley, and we are developing autonomous uh, electric uh, vehicles. Uh, so people always ask me why I switched industries. And it's interesting for me because I, I had to think about this a lot. Why did I leave the tech industry to come build autonomous electric vehicles? I think it's because profoundly I believe that the car as we know it today um, will ch radically transform in the next five to 10 years, and this will have a big impact on all of our lives. And when we get to autonomous vehicles, we will see a transformation in economic value that will probably be bigger than what we saw with the mobile internet, digital advertising, and e-commerce combined. Uh, and so that's what excited me, and that's why I uh, switched to be leading uh, NEO. Um, and so today, what I want to talk to you about is share a little bit about our vision for this car of the future. Um, and more importantly, when we think about autonomous vehicles, um, people usually have some blind spots um, about autonomous vehicles. And I want to really talk about those blind spots. Uh, by the way, I'll have uh, room for questions at the end, and South by Southwest is using uh, slido.com. So if you go to slido.com, uh, log in with the hashtag South by Southwest, there'll be a room and you can ask me questions, and I'm also happy to take questions at the end uh, with the microphones in the room. Um, so if you, if you kind of look at autonomous vehicles, right, you know, there are some misconceptions and misperceptions uh, that I call blind spots, and I want to address a few of those. Um, so cars are, interestingly, probably one of the most aspirational consumer products in human history. From the time we are little toddlers, we develop a deep love for cars. And for many of us, that love and they remain, cars remain our favorite position throughout our adult life. Um, actually, for many people, a car is the, probably the first big item that we purchase when we get a paycheck. This was certainly true for me. Uh, I bought a car with my first paycheck. It happened to be a 15-year-old Volkswagen Rabbit uh, that had a lot of rattle and shake. Um, but I loved that car. And I actually used to, every weekend, wash that car with my hand, take a bucket of water. I loved it so much. And I, to this day, remember what that car was. Um, and by the way, for most Americans, in America, people spend roughly 30% of our household income, buying cars. And in countries like China and India, that number is 100 to 180%. And not only that, we spend roughly 17% of our lives in cars today. So a significant percentage of our time we spend in cars today. But today's cars, if you think about today's cars, uh, they tend to be an ep epidemic, right? In fact, Morgan Stanley's research says that Cars today are the most underutilized, polluting, time-wasting, dangerous machines on the planet. Um, and if you kind of look at your relationships with your cars today, it probably looks something like this picture. It's very uh, slow, congested, stressful, and so it's not a great relationship that we have with vehicles. And by the way, this picture is uh, of one of the freeways in Austin, Texas. It's I-35, which I used to live in Austin before, and I used to go on this freeway every day to work. And, uh, and Austin is not one of the uh, bad cities for traffic. It's actually a very good city with respect to traffic. Um, so so how, what is the problem? You know, what are the problems we are trying to solve with autonomous vehicles? Uh, first problem with cars today is they waste our time, right? You know, productivity loss. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau said, uh, data says that about 140 million Americans spend 26 minutes one way getting to work and so roughly half an hour each way. 140 million Americans do that every single day, which if you do the math, that roughly translates to 1.8 trillion minutes that we waste in cars today. Or collectively, if you look at the whole population, that's 3.4 million years of 
productivity loss in the United States of America. It's mind-blowing to think about how much productivity loss that is. And that is, by the way, for an average person. There are some, the category called the mega commuters. Uh, so mega commuters usually spend 90 minutes one way, getting to work and back from work. So for those people, and there's roughly 4 million of those people in the United States, they are wasting roughly three hours a day, which translates on a, on a year to one month. One month of 4 million Americans, they are imprisoned in their car. It's sort of like they're being sent to a prison and they can't get out and use their time effectively. So that's a huge problem. And by the way, there's also research that says there's a 40% uh, increase in divorce rate when one partner commutes more than 45 minutes each way. So it's creating a lot of social issues as well for us, right? So that's a huge problem. Um, so I think if you look at Austin, this is a map of Austin. Anybody here live in Austin? So in Austin, average on an average, people spend roughly 47 hours a year commuting. And like I said, it's actually one of the better cities. If you look at cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, that number goes from 80 to 100 hours. So here's a map um, of uh, commuting um, in, um, in, in the rest of the United States. And actually what's happening in the US is now we are beginning to redefine regions based on commute time and distances. So they're actually blurring the lines between st uh, states and regions, and we are beginning to call these mega commute regions. And so this map actually reflects uh, where people live and how much they commute. And so these mega regions that are coming up because of commute issues and because of travel times are creating another problem, and that other problem is congestion. And um, the economic, World Economic Forum estimates that cumulative direct and indirect cost to the economy in the top four economies, US, UK, Germany, France, equates to roughly $4.8 trillion. And in the United States itself, it's $2.5 trillion, that number. So that's the impact on the economy because of congestion and the cost of congestion, both direct cost and indirect cost. And on a global basis, Roughly 130 billion minutes of productivity is lost in commutes. Um, and, and that's just a productivity loss, right? Like I said, social science and public health uh, research suggests when people commute, that has a negative impact on personal well-being and societal well-being because it leads to diseases like back pain, neck pain, obesity, um, stress, depression, and of course, death. You know, people tend to eat more junk food. We tend to eat uh, uh, drinks, sorry, larger sodas when we know we have to commute or sit in a car for an hour. So it causes a lot of health issues on top of productivity loss. So that's a big problem that uh, we will solve. So the second major issue why cars, we think of today's cars as an ep epidemic, is the pollution issue. Um, and if you've ever been to Beijing, or New Delhi, which is a city I grew up in. This is a picture actually from New Delhi. I was speaking at a conference there in December. Um, it, you, this whole, this actually, the issue of pollution really is hit home. How many of you have ever been or traveled to Beijing or New Delhi? I suspect many of us, right? And, and so obviously we know that in these countries, India and China, life expectancy for an average people is reduced by three to three and a half years because of air quality issues. And so we may think sitting here in the United States, and especially for me in California, that this is only a China problem or an India problem. But that's not true. These are pictures from around the world. And you can see Los Angeles actually is probably one of the most polluted cities um, if you think about smog there. Right? So on a global basis, there's roughly 3 million deaths, premature deaths, that are related to air quality issues worldwide. And so that's a mind-blowing number. And so this is an issue that affects all of us. And as we know, light, light trucks and cars contribute roughly 20% to this problem. And in the US, by the way, is the largest in terms of fossil fuel consumption and the second largest in contributing to air quality issues. And within the US, motor vehicles contribute 75% to carbon monoxide pollution. That's a mind-blowing number. Um, so internal combustion engines and vehicles that we all drive today are a big issue for the generations that come after us because we are 
we are contributing to re, uh, re, uh, ruining the environment that our children and our grandchildren will grow up in. Um, and so that's an issue. And the third issue is accidents. And I want to share a personal story. This is actually a picture of my car um, in the Bay Area. I was rear-ended twice in one month. In one month, uh, and one time I was just actually outside of my work, stopped at a traffic light, and somebody hit me from the back. I'm like, come on, I'm not even moving. I'm stopped at a traffic light and somebody hit me from the back. Clearly that person was distracted, most likely on a mobile phone, right? And so we are actually causing these distractions. You know, I worked at Cisco and, and Motorola creating these mobile technologies now, which are a big source of distraction. Uh, but in addition to technology, all of us as drivers have many, many other distractions, stress of work, stress of family, um, and so and the second time I was rear-ended, I was actually on a freeway and the traffic was slowing on a freeway and somebody didn't notice the traffic was slowing and they hit me and they were in a smaller car, so they actually had more damage to their car. But luckily nobody was hurt in both cases. Um, and so I would say we were lucky, both myself and the person, uh, the people that hit me. However, it does cost a lot, right? It, despite having insurance, it's pretty expensive when you have accidents like this. Um, and so on a worldwide basis, uh, roughly uh, uh, 1.3 million deaths are caused um, because of accidents, and 20 million, 20 to 50 million injuries and disabilities are caused because of car accidents. And in the United States, roughly 100 people die every day. 100 people die every day in car accidents. And it's the leasing, leading cause of death in the US for ages 5 to 24 is car accidents. So very young lives, children and young people die primarily in these car accidents. So this is a huge issue, right? And this is why I kind of think of cars today as an epidemic. Um, and so where do these accidents happen? This is a map of the United States which shows where the accidents occur. This is from the an NHTSA. And so basically wherever people live and wherever there are roads. And so there is no one single point we can say, okay, if we fix that area, accidents are gonna go away. Um, and by the way, 95% of accidents today are caused because of human error. So if we live somewhere and we're driving somewhere, very likely that we will have an accident in the U U US. The statistics say that on an average, every person in the United States will have a f roughly at least five accidents in their life. So I guess I was lucky I had both of mine in one month and didn't get hurt in that. Um, and so here's Austin, by the way, if you live in Austin, uh, my next slide shows you the accident where there's a propensity for accidents. And again, it's probably the areas where most people live and are driving to work. And so this is not unique to any particular city. It really is very prevalent to all of us. So if you look at all that, productivity loss, pollution, accidents, autonomous vehicles truly are the answer to these, solutions, to these problems, right? And so sensing technology, vision, artificial intelligence, uh, compute, very high performance compute that's being developed by companies like NVIDIA, Vision from Mobileye, these companies, allows us now to actually have vehicles that are a lot safer um, for us to be in and that are a lot more conducive to allowing us to be productive. So it is time to let go of that wheel, finally. Uh, but having said that, there is a transition we have to make and today, there are a lot of blind spots uh, or misconceptions or misperceptions about autonomous vehicles, both in the industry and how the industry is addressing that, and for us as human beings to accept this technology and get comfortable with that. So in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about five blind spots today, and I'm sure there are many others, but I feel these are the five that are most important for us to address, and especially for us as a company, we are taking these five as the challenges that have to be solved. Um, so the first uh, blind spot that I want to talk about um, is the notion that autonomy and performance are mutually exclusive. In other words, when you close your eyes and think about an autonomous vehicle, what image comes to mind? Most likely a funny looking car with something on the top that's rotating, it's kind of ugly, probably don't want to get into it. Uh, it's a car that I wouldn't buy with my first paycheck, right? Um, and, and we feel that is incorrect. We feel autonomy and performance um, can coexist. And, and 
it isn't one or the other. When you think about an autonomous vehicle, it doesn't have to look ugly. It doesn't have to move like it's a little golf cart. It can be an amazing performance vehicle that looks beautiful from a design perspective. And so in order to demonstrate that autonomy and performance uh, can live together, we were here. Anybody recognize this picture? What do you think it is? Awesome. Wow, you must be at a car aficionado. So this is the F1 track called the Circuit of the Americas. It's about 15 miles southeast of here. Um, the acronym, people fondly call it COTA, the COTA track. And so we were here about two uh, weeks ago, I think, a little over two weeks ago. Uh, some of my team and I were here with this car. Um, this, by the way, is our car. This is called the NEO EP9. Our company is called NEO. And EP9 is now the fastest electric car in the world. And if you'd like to see this, uh, we have it uh, at our uh, venue at Copper Tank. Love to have you there and love to show it to you. So we took our EP9, we retrofitted it or modified it with some sensors and some radars, GPS antennas. And this car drove around the Formula One racetrack without a driver on its own and has now set a record for the fastest autonomous car in the planet. And it reached a peak speed of 160 miles per hour. I have a short video next that will talk to you about how we did this. As a company started in 2014 with the idea that we wanted to build a global startup, tapping into the talent distributed around the world to change the experiences we all have with vehicles. We embarked on a project to upgrade an existing supercar to incorporate additional technology elements that would allow it to drive without a driver behind the wheel. Obviously the EP9 is an extremely sophisticated vehicle to begin with, so we were able to tap into a lot of that technology and augment it with high precision inertia measurement units, GPS antennas, and additional compute power so that it could replay with extremely high precision a track at high speeds. While I drive the reference lab, the car is learning everything that I'm doing. We try to find the track limits with GPS, and so we go out and map what we know is the inside edge of the track and the outside edge of the track, and we have those as visual cues in our data. And then what we do is we go out and drive a lap so the car can actually learn and see where the human would drive the car. And from that data, try to as best match what I'm doing with the actual car's position. speed very capable car. It's an amazing car, it's a beast if I may say and there were many associated challenges with making sure that it's able to follow the track that we wanted to follow. When you calculate commands every 2.5 milliseconds you have to make sure from one calculation to the next the transition is really smooth and we don't provide very aggressive maneuvers at very high speeds. We were trying to push the limits of the vehicle and trying to push the limits of our software and we found those limits and as part of that we went into an oversteer condition and the oversteer condition just caused us to spin out. We buckled down, we pulled the car in, we found replacement parts, we had people fly in with spare parts and we got the car out the next afternoon. Okay, I am now in run in map two, 
Did you confirm Aaron has asked to run? Is it ready? I confirm he's ready. Okay, so Steve, go to run now. Run, run. Here we go. What we are seeing today is three engineers and the team that they're working with going sleepless for four months, pushing themselves and pushing the technology and the vehicle to its limits. So thank you. You know, as much as that car is amazing and beautiful and it's a, it's a powerful machine and uh, the fact that we broke the record makes me feel very proud. But uh, the thing that really touches me more than that is the commitment the engineering team had to pull this off. And you know, people ask us, we're a startup, how can we beat companies that have been in the space for 100 years, 80 years, 120 years? It's because of people like that. People like that that you saw in the video that are very committed to a mission. Um, to me, it's really the story is about the human spirit to, to change the world of uh, mobility, and we we have a great team. And many of the people you saw in the video are the same people working on uh, production cars. Hopefully, that you will be driving um, very soon. So, the first blind spot that autonomy and performance cannot live together, we feel, is a misconception, and we can combine autonomy and uh, performance together. And the next. Um, blind spot that people have around autonomy is many auto manufacturers think about autonomy as a feature. They think you can take an existing car and add autonomy as a feature. Uh, sometimes it's thought, talked about as a software speech feature. Sometimes it's talked about as a hardware uh, feature. Even the panel before me right here in this hall, they were talking about mapping and how you need to map things. And so people usually um, I would say most manufacturers, when they think about uh, autonomy, they think of it as something that you could add to an existing vehicle. Autonomy is, in fact, a full stack. And so if you look at the car industry, again, I say it's about 100, 120-year-old industry, probably from the 1900s to the 1970, most of the innovation in the car industry had to do with mechanical systems and hydraulic systems. A lot of engineering innovation went into making these cars better machines. A lot of the innovation was in the mechanical and hydraulic systems. And then from the 70s until recently, there was a lot of innovation that drove the auto industry in the electrical and electronic systems. And we saw the birth of EVs, including Tesla, which is now a performance vehicle, but an EV. It's only now that we are beginning to see the shift to digital systems. The, the innovation primarily is going to come from the digital side. And, and notice I say digital and not software. There's a big difference. You know, to me, digital is software-defined hardware. The hardware is as important as the software, but the software actually drives what the hardware requirements are going to be and not the other way around. And there's a huge, huge dis distinction in that. And we believe the next generation vehicle, and this is what I call car 3.0, Right? The third generation of innovation in the automotive industry is going to come primarily from the digital side. In order to drive that innovation, we have to think of the car as a computer. And if you think of the car as a computer and think of the car as a robot driven by software, you have to re-architect pretty much every layer in the stack. And so this is how we think of the car 3.0 stack. And an important distinction is my team in Silicon Valley is actually organized this way. 
Um, and this is important because you are not suboptimizing one element for the other. So we have to drive innovation all the way from the fail operational powertrain, the thing that powers the car, to the chassis or the physical car itself, uh, to the vehicle network, moving the in-vehicle network from CAN and LIN architecture to Ethernet, and bringing the concepts that exist in the internet world today about encryption, about firewalling, about content distribution network. All these things don't exist in the cars today. And so the car, if you think of it, the network in the car uh, is like a dial-up modem. Anybody remember what it was like accessing the internet from a dial-up modem? Raise your hand if you remember what it was like. Okay, a few old people in the audience like me. Um, and so that was a very painful experience, right? And today we don't, we don't do that. We have Slido, we have WhatsApp, we have WeChat. Everything goes on the mobile internet at incredible speed. And it's encrypted and it's kept safe. So the net network in the vehicle fundamentally has to change for autonomy. And on top of that, of course, we have the sensors and the computer and the AI. A lot of discussion around autonomy today centers around that, the vision part, the perception part. But that's a very small part of what needs to happen for, an, for a car to be a fully autonomous vehicle. Tiny part, as exciting as all that is. And then on top of that, you need contextual intelligence, which means you have to combine machine learning and artificial intelligence and deep learning with the context based on who you are with in the car, where are you going, and what's the destination. Because by the way, a car is different from the smartphone that way. Even a simple thing like music, the kind of music you listen to in your car when you're alone is probably different from the kind of music you listen to when your spouse or partner or children are in the car. I like Lady Gaga, I play an Adele, I play very loudly when I'm in the car by myself. If my husband is in the car with me, we listen to NPR. Um, <laughs> right, he's sitting right here so I can pick on him. Uh, for many people, like, that's true. I think so, it is, it's the experiences we have are very contextual in the car. And the car is also a confined space. When we're in the car, um, it, is, it is captive, right? It's captive audience. And so contextual intelligence becomes extremely important. We feel this is an emerging field, um, and this is something we are very heavily focused on. Uh, and then the top two layers are the application level, the cockpit. You know, so traditionally this is called the infotainment in the car. And today the infotainment is completely optimized for the driver. And when you go to driverless cars, that whole thing needs to change. Right? It needs to be for everyone in the car. It needs to adjust based on whether you're driving or not driving, what the weather conditions are. You know, If I'm going to a board meeting, if I land in Seattle and I'm going to a Microsoft board meeting, I'm probably reading the board material in preparation for the meeting. When I left the meeting and I'm coming back to the airport, I'm checking to see if my flight is on time. So I think the cockpit needs to present information to you based on the context. So it's very, very interrelated to what we think. And digital mobility, by the way, we mean when the car is not, when you're no longer driving in your car and you get two to three hours of your time back, what are you going to be doing with that time? And people always think like, God, I'm, will you make me work again? I don't want to work anymore. I'm working all the time. Maybe that's not the point. You maybe want to sleep in your car. You want to be peaceful in your car. But there's different ways for us to make use of that time, right? You know, which creates, this is where I talk about the autonomous economy. Just like the smartphone was a gateway that created something huge and bigger called the mobile internet, when we get to autonomous vehicles, there'll be a huge big opportunity to create something bigger that we call autonomous economy. And digital mobility really is about creating those type of services. All of this has to be driven first and foremost by what we call human-centered interface design and experience design. So it is all about people. That way, again, a car, as a product matter, it matters where it lives with and who it's living with. Is it living with a family of seven in New Delhi or Shanghai, or is it living with a single person in San Francisco or Austin? The type of product has to be very different. That's not true for smartphones. So user-centered design and interface design, experience design become extremely important in the cars of the future. And then the back end, by the way, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles roughly push t seven terabytes of data an hour, right, Jamie? And so there's that much data that's being ca captured with a single vehicle. This data all needs to go somewhere. And so like, architecting the data platform where it doesn't become a critical point, where today's most auto manufacturers just push data into the cloud. At some point, that's going to become very inefficient. You have to be very clever 
about routing data, just like today on the internet, the information gets routed. In the future, data has to get routed, and we have to come up with ideas like data routers instead of bit routers uh, for pushing information. And security is extremely important. We have to have end-to-end -end security. So the point is, unless you're architecting a full autonomous vehicle, completely differently at each of these layers, we will have a suboptimum experience for users and a very exp exp expensive product in the end. And so we think of autonomy as a full stack and not just as a, as a feature. Um, the third blind spot that I want to talk about is uh, the misconception that autonomous vehicles compromise safety. And, and it's very natural, right? We all grew up being taught how to hold the steering wheel when we are driving. In fact, in the US, when I learned how to drive, uh, you weren't given a license if you were not holding the steering wheel at, at 12 and 3 or whatever it was. I don't even remember. There was a particular position you had to hold the steering wheel. And so it's very hard to let go of that, right? How many of you are nervous to be in an autonomous vehicle and not have to hold anything? Actually, few of you only. That's good. Most people would say, well, I'm scared of autonomous vehicles, right? But actually, the opposite is true. We can architect and engineer vehicles to be uh, much more safe. And, and the reason is, if you look at this picture, this shows how the cars of today are wired. This is typically the wiring harness that exists um, in cars of today. So if any fuse or any controller or any component breaks, the car actually breaks down. And it's impossible to diagnose which fuse breaks, right? So you end up taking it to the shop or getting it towed, and basically you have a broken down vehicle that you have to fix. In the future, car network is going to look something like this. Most likely it'll have three or four servers, um, and a lot of the ECUs can be consolidated, and Ethernet will be the mode of communication. And just like in servers today, when one server fails, the internet doesn't break down, you know, things get routed, we can actually do that in the car. So we have to think of the car as a node on the data center or a data center itself. And so this is one of our innovations, and we are architecting the, the network for the vehicle of the future. So the fourth blind spot, most people, when they think about autonomy, they think of it as exclusive. It's only for a few people. It's going to be super expensive. You have to be really tech savvy uh, to drive an autonomous vehicle. Maybe those people in California will drive one, but nobody else will care, uh, right? And, and the opposite is really true. If you think about autonomous vehicles, they democratize mobility. Uh, with autonomous vehicles, you can actually drive many, many miles more. So, of course, ride sharing will become uh, very much more affordable much more popular, but in addition to that, even ownership, right? Maybe we will go, go to a point where every household doesn't need to own four vehicles, uh, but there will be many, many ho more households that will own a vehicle. Um, so everybody in India who's riding a bicycle today will be able to afford a car sometime in the future because with digital technology, costs come down dramatically. Um, they're not as expensive as analog technologies to make, which we've proven that with every shift in compute, in mobile, um, and now going forward, that will be true in the vehicle. The other thing with autonomous vehicles is, is it democratizes mobility and provides access to everyone, including people who are unable to drive because of physical limitations or have restricted ability to drive because of age. People like this will now all of a sudden have access to mobility or people with families and children that are just trying to juggle too many things and don't want to be caught in a situation of stressful commutes that I talked about. So really autonomous uh, vehicles will make life better for billions of people, and the technology will get to a point where it's not about the technology. The user interface will what will drive, where the technology is hidden, and it'll be very easy to use. The, the UI will make it, this a very powerful transition. And so we have a short video to show what this experience might look like in the future. Oh, did we skip the video? Can when I go back to the video, please? Got it?
a cozy hidden cove Past the old orange grove A happy little nest That always feels the best A gentle kind of nook Where you'd never think to look There's a place that I go There's a place that only I know There is a place where I can be Any and all different kinds of me So we just uh, announced yesterday that we will be bringing um, autonomous vehicles to the U.S. market by 2020. And so that kind of is an indication of how that experience would be by 2020, where we won't be driving in our cars and the UI will be intuitive. It will actually help us be productive, help us be playful, help us be peaceful. So it's not just you would end up working in your car also all the time, but you know, maybe you'll get news about your family, right? You know, in that video, we saw that she heard um, one of her friends or somebody in the family had a baby. And so that kind of information can come real time to you. You can interact. You can see the baby right away. You can be part of that experience. Um, and then she's working in the car when she wants to work. She's sleeping. She's reading a book. And so it is really how does the car in the future become a living space and a welcoming living space where you can be everything you want to be. And so that is our goal. And so we, we will directionally try to work on things like that for the vehicles that we'll be bringing into the market by 2020. Um, so the next blind spot um, that fe people have with autonomy um, is uh, it, it, people think it's all about technology. Because like most of the discussion, actually, even at South by Interactive, a lot of the panels have to do with maps or uh, sensors or LIDARs and radars. And you know, I'm a technologist. I'm an engineer. I love that stuff. But to me, really, the power of autonomous vehicles is because it's about people. It is really about saving lives, giving you the time back to be everything you want to be. Because today in cars, no matter who you are in your life, the minute you enter your car, you're reduced to become a driver. Um, and so how do we free you from that? How do we free you from being imprisoned in your car for one month in, your, in a year if you're in the United States, commuting 90 minutes um, uh, each way to work and, and allow you to be who you want to be? So last video that kind of captures that vision.
So I think the point is, if we imagine a future where you're actually looking forward to your commute, because when you're commuting is when you can be most productive. You're commuting in this beautiful space that moves you. You will be most peaceful, and you will actually discover things. So imagine a future where you're not reduced to a driver anymore, and you can be everything you want to be in your life, and you will not miss a moment of what's truly important to you in your life because you're not stuck in traffic or you, you haven't been rear-ended and you cannot get home and you're stuck on the front. By the way, I called 911 when I got rear-ended, but I still had to wait on the side of the highway because it was not a fatal accident for three hours before I could get home that day through no fault of mine. So imagine all that pain being gone from, from you. So the future that we are committed to create with autonomous vehicles is really a beautiful living space that will be the space that will move you. This is not a dream. This is not just a vision. This is actually a car that we have built that envisions the future that we have uh, to show you. So if you come to our venue in Copper Tank, you'll actually see this car. It's an unbelievably beautiful space. I can promise you, if cars of future look like this, we would want to actually live in them. And so that's our commitment. Uh, this is the opportunity I feel the automobile, automobile or mobility industry of the future has. Um, and, you know, we are primarily a tech company, but we are passionate about this because we feel there's just so many problems with cars of today. So the opportunity we feel we have is to change our experiences from driving to being, being human beings, so that we can realize all of the potential that is within us. Uh, so thank you for uh, listening. Uh, I would, like I said, invite all of you to come visit us at Copper Tank. Uh, we are at uh, 504 Trinity Street. You will see the fastest autonomous electric car there, as well as the vision car uh, that I just uh, showed you. I'm now happy to take questions. I have some questions here that are coming in from our online audience, so I will take those. And if you have questions, they have microphones in the middle. Feel free to use them. Uh, so the first question I'm reading up here is, I think, and these are voted, so I'm assuming the most popular question, I'm told, shows up on the top, so I'm going to go in that order. What are your thoughts on car ownership versus alternative mod models for using and riding vehicles? So clearly, ride share is becoming very popular um, all around the world, and I think definitely there is, a, uh, there is a need for that, and actually autonomous vehicles make that easier for us. But why is ride share popular? We have to ask ourselves, why is ride share popular? It's popular because it is on demand. We, the ride is there when we need it. Uh, the vehicle shows up when we want it. Um, but having said that, I do, I do believe that what I started with, right, in the picture of a little kid playing with the, with the toy car, cars do tend to be these passionate, very uh, uh, passionate consumer products that we all want to own. So I think as long as we remove the barriers that exist today with ownership, people will buy cars. And so I think there's room for both. Um, I don't feel one will completely eliminate the other. Just because we have Airbnb doesn't mean we're not buying homes, right? You know, there is, a, we all, there is something personal attached to the places we live in, and the cars will be that in the future. Um, and I know you're waiting. Well, let me take one more question. Um, it seems like many companies are talking about autonomy. How soon will it really come to life, and what are the barriers? So we are committing to bring autonomous vehicles, full level four autonomous vehicles, meaning the cars will be completely capable of driving themselves in uh, constrained environments such as highways. Our first use case we are solving for is commute use case by 2020 in the US. So that's not that far away. So they will be here sooner than we think. So let me go to you, and then I'll come back to the screen. So I have a question for you about um, building on this discussion as it relates to smart cities. And um, I think oftentimes when we talk about autonomous vehicles, electronic vehicles, we're mostly talking about developed countries. Um, I'm a journalist and I focus on emerging markets. And I wonder where you see the implications for emerging markets, especially when it comes to, say, smart city strategies in some of these developing country cities. Um, how soon will they see the impact of some of this? And regardless, how should it be, be a part of planning even today? 
That's a great question. Um, definitely, I think autonomous vehicles will have a huge impact on urban planning, right? Now, that's the next. This is why I talk about it's not just a car. It's autonomous economy in the future. It's going to touch many, many different industries. And city planning, urban planning is one of those because we don't need parking structures, right, anymore. The car can actually go park itself outside of the city, and we don't have to waste prime real estate in the center of the city and pay, I don't know how much you guys pay here in Austin, but I know in San Francisco, we pay up to like $30 an hour for parking, which is insane, right? Um, and so you don't need that kind of expensive real estate for parking. Um, so I think in, in emerging countries, the, the, there's two challenges. Firstly, many emerging countries, and like I said, I grew up in India, but the same is true in China or Mexico City, any of these cities. The traffic patterns are uh, very um, non-rule based, meaning nobody follows rules on the highways. And so that makes it very difficult for a computer to deal with. Uh, so the AI has to advance quite a lot with the unpredictability in human motion. Um, it's a little easier in developed countries because people, the highways are clearly defined and people follow rules. Um, having said that, I think when there are new cities being formed, McKinsey's data, uh, McKinsey did a research that says by 2030, um, majority of the population in the world will be moving to cities. So we'll be urbanizing much more as a world um, on a global basis. And so it's an opportunity for us to actually rethink cities with autonomous vehicles. So new cities in emerging markets, in emerging countries, have to be planned with this notion. Um, and I think they're beginning to think that. I know, I know in India there is a city outside of Mumbai that's being planned around uh, as a smart city. And when I was at Cisco, we were working on that. And so areas like that in pockets around the world where emerging markets are recognizing the potential, it requires a lot of public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. It's not something that just a company can do. The government has to participate in many of these countries. Great. But that's Thank a great you. question. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Let me take one more from here, and I will come back to you. Uh, why, why is autonomous driving always married with electric vehicles? Is that a connection, a technical requirement, or just easier for startups to dis di disrupt Detroit? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, whoever asked this, uh, thank you for asking that. You know, I mean, no, I don't think there is a technical requirement why autonomous ve vehicles cannot be ICEs. Uh, there's no technical barrier. Um, Having said that, I think with electric vehicles, it's easier to build autonomy just because, like I showed you on that stack, um, one of the important elements in autonomy is what we call um, fail operational, meaning that anything fails, the car will actually come to a safe stop. Um, so if a component fails in that complicated network I showed you, it's very difficult for an autonomous vehicle to stop itself. The reason, one of the reasons why autonomous vehicles are so expensive today is most auto manufacturers use redundancy, meaning they double everything, so that if one component fails, you have another component, so which means you will have like double of it pretty much. It's like saying if you want to buy a penthouse, you need to buy the whole building. Um, you know, so that's what happens when you build redundancy. Um, so electric vehicles allow us to eliminate a lot of that stuff. It's like getting rid of the things that exist today in the cars that you don't need when you're thinking of the car of the future. Other than that, there's no technical uh, requirement. So is it easier for startups to disrupt uh, Detroit with EVs? Maybe. Uh, it is easier to build an electric vehicle than it is to build an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, but also, I think we're not just trying to solve one problem. I think, like I said, there are three big problems with cars today. Pollution is one of them, and electric vehicles help us get there. Let me take your question next. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation, Ms. Warrior. Zach Bolton here from Continental. And we talked a little bit about infrastructure and how that would affect this autonomous vehicle. But at NEO, are, they, are, are your discussions with areas outside of the typical automotive infrastructure, like your networking companies, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, right down to cybersecurity, Cisco, to our home electronics, Nest, Dyson, whomever, are you putting that on the forefront of some of your development right now? Would you say it's secondary right now, or it's passive and we'll let those industries build up and we'll keep an eye on them and then bridge them together 2020, 2021? Okay, there were like six questions there. Uh, so that's cheating, by the way. Sorry. So let me, let me try to answer them. That's a great question. Again, like I said, it's the beginning of something bigger. I think I, I kind of I, you know, compare this to the transition that I saw. Uh, 
uh, with the smartphones. And by the way, at that time, I was at Motorola, and I was leading engineering, so I was on the other side um, of the disruptive change. And we all thought, when Apple did the first smartphone, we all thought, like, okay, yeah, it's a smartphone, but really fine. You know, are people really going to spend five, six hundred dollars to buy this, right? You know, people are are using cell phones and throwing them away. But it wasn't about really the smartphone. It was about accessing the internet from a mobile device. That was the big idea. Uh, similarly, I think with autonomous vehicles, it's really not just about the car. It is truly a gateway for something bigger. What are we? What will you be doing when you have that time? You become the car, then becomes literally a computer with applications, perhaps, and ways is that you will be you'll be doing work right you know you'll be doing commerce in the car you'll be watching content in the car so that's the big idea it truly is the next big compute platform um, and so if you think of that, there is an opportunity for network providers or, or um, I would say connectivity providers, whether it's uh, cellular providers or Wi-Fi, you know, different kinds of technologies. A car essentially becomes a router on wheels in, in some ways, right? Um, and so there is that opportunity. But is everybody ready to make the transition all at the same time? I don't think so. Um, I think the way we are approaching it is first you have to architect the car differently. And so my team is working on, like I said, every layer of that stack has to change. It is not an old car. You know, I think there's a big difference between level two and level four, and we are skipping level three. Level three says that the car drives itself, but you as a human being need to be able to take over in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, which is impossible. And so we feel that's very unsafe. So we are going from level two to level four. In level two, the technology is helping you be a better driver, right? It's a driver assisted. In fact, it's called a ADAS, uh, assisted driving system. Level four, you are helping the car drive. The car is driving most of the time itself. And we, when it cannot drive, it, tell you, it tells you to take over. There's a huge difference. So the vehicle needs to architect. So that's the first step. Then we have to bring AVs to the market. And then I think we'll see this evolution of service providers and network providers and content providers, perhaps, that will see this as a platform. But a big change that's happening already is the AI companies are recognizing this transition, right? So whether it's Alexa or Cortana or Siri or whoever, all these companies, now the next battlefront for the mobile is really about um, voice AI, right? And so that is the personal assistance. And so will that, how will that enter the car? I think that industry is seeing the change already. Uh, but I would say some of these other connected home, et cetera, are a little further away. So, so sorry it was a long answer, but there were six questions. I wanted to make sure I hit all of them. I'll go to you, and then I'll go back to the screen. Hi, thanks. It was a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to extend on the first of his six or seven questions here a little bit. Uh, do you guys have any? Uh, research and data on uh, physical, what the cost of physical infrastructure improvements for automated cars compared to the cost of uh, increased investments, say, in public transportation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I don't think one replaces the other. I think so. Will public transportation become ride share in the future? Mm. I think that most likely will happen, right? Now, so if you have a vehicle that can pick you up anytime you need it, so think about like a ride-share company, but now it's an autonomous vehicle company, would you need mass public transportation anymore? And how will that change? So I think that's a whole another topic. Um, I think will the, will the, so the trade-off you're saying, right? You know, with autonomous vehicles, will, will that, what is the cost trade-off? I think the big cost trade-off with autonomous vehicles is you don't need the expensive real estate today we spend for parking. Um, the, exp the, the expense we will, the, infra not infrastructure, but the cost associated with insurance will go down dramatically. Right, and a lot of insurance today is because of human error. That's what we are insuring against. Um, you don't need that, right? That infrastructure will change. A lot of the servicing will drop, right? And a lot of the accidents lead to broken parts, and so there's a lot of maintenance industry. So the, the first initial cost efficiency will, we will see with, with these types of things, parking infrastructure, insurance, servicing, body you know body shop repair a lot of those kinds of things we'll see a lot of cost efficiency that i think more than makes up for the investment we would have to make with avs and evs the public transit question i think is a different one because it's not it, it is really about convenience and so how man, how many cities in the us truly have a public transportation system that works right so you have to look at are we better off putting that in or do we leapfrog and just go to ride share so my, my own belief, and maybe because I'm more biased to technology, is we leapfrog and go to right share. Thanks. 
Okay, a couple more questions. I have four minutes left, so maybe I'll have time for two more. Uh, how big is the market opportunity for autonomous vehicles? Um, so it depends on who you ask. Uh, I think uh, there are various estimates. There's various reports, but I would say from our research, uh, on an average, people estimate by 2030, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the market will be autonomous vehicles. So, you know, you can argue is that aggressive or that's conservative. Um, that's a global number uh, worldwide. I think obviously some countries will be ahead of other countries in adapting that. So. Um, Okay, uh, one more question. How do you handle the amount of data that will be created with autonomous vehicles? Great question. Um, you know, so I think this is where we have to be very clever. Actually, this is without giving up too much of our secret sauce, we're working on this. Because today, the way even Google, which is probably the most advanced in this area, the way they push their data is the car gets, their autonomous vehicles get plugged in at the end of the day, and they push all that data then to the cloud. Now, there's two problems with that. Firstly, you have to store all that data at, in the car uh, until you're able to push it to the cloud. Um, and then they do it through a physical connection because it's too expensive to push it on a 3G or a wireless connection um, today. Um, so one, so that will probably always exist, meaning there'll be some data that will have to be stored locally in the car, and then there'll be some data that will be pushed into the cloud. And by the way, it's not just pushing the data from the car to the cloud, but actually the data coming from the cloud to the car. Um, and so literally we have to think of a very different architecture here, just as we have done um, in the internet, right? You know, so your phone, for example, today, you're able to get instantaneous updates, right? So if it's something critical, you get an instant instantaneous update, but you don't necessarily have all the apps open all the time where data is getting pushed all the time. So we know how to do this in the internet space, uh, which means we have to think of different concepts, just like a router, which I come from that world having been at Cisco. You know, the basic function of a router is to route information in a smart way, so the internet's always running, right? So at Cisco, we used to say we are the backbone of the internet, and a router and a switch in the internet architecture do that. Uh, so in the car, that routing now you have to translate to data. So data has to be routed in a different way. So the concepts we've had about routing and switching with bits and bytes of data in the IP or internet protocol, we now have to bring into the car for the data platform. And so my team um, is working on that. And so this will be a very dramatically different, very innovative architecture that I bet you nobody is really thinking about. At the end, we want to make sure that every aspect of the technology is progressing, and this is a very big one. I've got two more minutes, and I'm seeing lots of questions come up, so I'm going to try and hit as many as possible. Um, do you envision a convergence of commute, commuting in autonomous cars, telecommuting, and AR and VR, and immersive experiences to enable more productivity and pleasure? Um, so I think, again, this will happen in a sequential way. I don't think... Uh, so in other words, for us to use the vehicle as an immersive, productive space, we don't have to wait for AR and VR to mature. There's other ways to do that. And so I think the main thing that will drive what the productive suite of applications will be in the car will be the consumer demand. So I think we will look at what is the consumer demand, and I think in some respects AR may be ahead of VR. So for sure, I think AR will have a play in the vehicles first before VR does. Um, and so I think they will be a timeline in which these things will uh, happen. Um, uh, sorry, I have one more or two more questions. Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on autonomous uh, vehicles for ownership? So I think I already addressed that. You know, I, I, we believe that uh, people will own autonomous vehicles again because we have to. We, today there's a blind spot where people think autonomous vehicles are very slow, very ugly. I think we, the minute we change that blind spot, we will see a demand for these. Um, last question. Um, today, connected cars are hacked from a anywhere. What do you think about hacking, hacking attacks in the future? Again, a great question. Um, this is very fundamental, again, to our car 3.0 architecture. Today, the reason most cars get hacked is the CAN architecture you cannot encrypt. It's very actually very easy to hack a, a, hack a CAN, right? Most, if you ask in Silicon Valley, the way most people take an existing car and make autonomy work is to hack the CAN network. It takes about six months on an average for people to do this with um, many of the cars today. So we have to think of the network in the car as that a, 
network of the future and encrypt that end to end. So this is again an area where we are working on with a lot of cybersecurity experience that's coming into our company from consumer internet companies. That's the end of my time. So thank you all for listening and thanks for being here.